Advanced Operating Systems 2020 Week 8, Formal Verification and SEO 4. So today I'm going to talk about the, some of the cool stuff we've been doing and continuing to do, uh, in particular the, the verification story. But before we get into that, let's um, talk a bit about assurance and verification in general. I've done a very brief interview overview of that in week six, and um, t today I'm going to go a bit into more detail what it really means. So. This is what I had up before in week six, right? We have assurance, which is basically glorified ISO 9000 and code inspection and all that sort of stuff. So a systematic evaluation and testing. And um, then there's formal methods, which is all about mathematical proof techniques. So the above is sort of more traditional software engineering kind of stuff, and below is the more solid stuff. And um, the, the aim of both is the same. They try to establish that the system is, in a sense, dependable. Right? It's does, it does what it's supposed to be doing, and it's not doing things it's not supposed to be doing. And then, in, if you have formal regimes which require this, for example, safety-critical systems in avionics or um, medical devices, or uh, systems for that um, deal with highly secure data, highly um, sensitive data, then you tend to have a certification step where some independent body looks at the artifacts that came out of the either assurance or formal verification and says, yes, this um, satisfies requirements according to some standard and gives you a stamp and then you go shop around and says it's um, blah, blah, blah certified. So that's the basic idea. And what um, Assurance looks at is various stages of the system life cycle. So a specification um, where it's about, okay, is, it, is the system's functionality clearly defined? Um, and again, of course, that can be done formally and informally. Traditionally, it's informal, so all in English. And increasingly, it's formal, meaning some sort of mathematics. And then the design of the system do we have an overall design that justifies uh, us claiming that it somehow um, um, satisfies the specification? And again, this can be done formally or informally. And then there's the implementation where people look at, OK, does the implementation actually match what the, the, the design says? And again, this can be uh, formally and informally, and informal techniques you're all aware of. This is like code inspection and um, testing, etc. And uh, formal techniques would again be mathematical proofs. And then there's the maintenance, which is okay, once we have the system and it's in operation and people are changing things, can be configuration or actual implementation, patches, etc. Um, how are these done in a way that the system continues to satisfy the above things? And I'm not going to talk about that. This is the most boring thing. And um, then for f formal, not in the formal in a mathematical sense, but in the sense of strictly defined assurance schemes, there's then this certification body which says, OK, all these things have been done according to what we require, and then we certify it. And um, the, there's typically, depending on the application domains, there's international standards or sometimes industry standards that specify how to go about this. The m most best known one for security critical systems is common criteria. So this is an international ISO standard, goes back to 99, so it's 20 years old. Uh, it actually goes back on a good 10 years earlier to what was called the Orange Book. That's one of the most famous documents in computer security. This is the US DOD created in the 80s, what was called the Rainbow Series, a number of color-coded books um, looking at a specific part of the overall security story. And the Orange Book talked about how do we evaluate that the system meets its security requirements. So it's called the Trusted Computer System Evaluation Criteria. Um, 
the, the orange book is actually surprisingly good read. You can actually, it, it's, it's reasonably readable and it's not too thick. I've got a copy in my office. Everyone should have had a look at it at some stage. And from that was then derived the common criteria standard. And as international standards go, it blows out by a fact of 10 and um, everyone has their say, etc. And it becomes usually messy and complicated, etc. What Orange, the Orange Book already did is it introduced um, certification levels. So saying that, well, it doesn't make sense to evaluate every system to the same rigor. At the, the rigor should be adjusted to the requirements. How critical is the system? And they had um, different levels of evaluation and of specification of requirements, starting with C, which is sort of fairly informal, and B, very systematic, and then A, which required formal proof. And no system actually ever got um, evaluated according to as an A system. And then common criteria took this on. And um, systematized it in several ways. In particular, they clear, more clearly distinguished between the security requirements and the um, rigor of evaluation. And so the, 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 techno uh, the terminology around that talks about a target of evaluation. So this is the system you're evaluating. A security target, which is basically a codified set of requirements which you need to meet. So for example, you may have a security target of what's called a separation kernel, um, which says, OK, it sh needs to do certain, um, enforce certain isolation requirements. And then there is a um, protection profile which um, applies these security targets to a specific scenario. And there would be one for a separation kernel, which is all about isolation. And then orthogonal to that is evaluation, or mostly orthogonal, is evaluation levels. And they basically say how much effort is put into evaluating the trustworthiness of the system. And common criteria has um, seven of these evaluation assurance levels. Starts with EL1. Well, basically, they just have a look at the um, uh, specification and nothing else. And this is hardly a tire kicking exercise. And um, I don't know whoever went through the bother of getting a system certified at EL1. It means nothing. And then if you go down, then they, the evaluation becomes more thorough. So with EL2, they also start looking at the design. And then EL3 and EL4 are just a sort of more rigorous way of looking at design and specification. And you can see implementation is not evaluated. So even up to EL4, which is the highest ever achieved for commercial system or general purpose system, they don't even look at the implementation, <laughs> which tells you, hmm, OK, what really is this worth? And you'll see that even more clear when we look at what systems have been evaluated. And then. EL5 is where it starts getting serious, where they require semi-formal specification and design, which means they use some sort of formal language. It's not really mathematic, but it's at least it's not just English. It's more um, precise pseudocode, if you like, for specifying and um, design and evaluate, um, for specifying and designing the system. The implementation is now being actually looked at, but still informally. And then on at EL6, you have a formal requ a requirement for formally specifying the system, re the safety requirements. So this now needs, uh, in very ambiguous mathematical language, um, the, the requirements need to be stated. But everything else below that is still informal. And only at the highest level, EL7, we have a formalization of the specification as well as design, but the implementation is still informal, which basically means you have a, a mathematical model of your system at the design level, and then you need to argue that, OK, this code corresponds to this formal model there. And over the years, the, so common criteria can be applied to hardware as well as software. And in the software space, it can be crypto or operating systems or other things. We are obviously interested in operating systems. And these are, unless something was added very recently, which I don't think has, are pretty much the ones, the protection profiles that apply to operating systems. So we have the old CAP. This is pretty dated. 
um, controlled access um, protection profile, which basically means the system has to have an access control model and has to implement it. This is, in a nutshell, what this requirement is. So, I mean, every OS should have that, right? <laughs> Nothing really particularly interested thing. And then the, um, that's got superseded by the single level operating system PP, the SLOP, SLOS. Um, and that's basically sort of defines what we expect from a normal general purpose operating system that yes, it has protection, etc. And um, this can be used up to EL4. So each of these protection profile has a maximum evaluation level for which it can be used. Beyond that, um, it's considered not suitable for more thorough evaluation. You need to have a more uh, precise specification. And then is the labeled security protection profile. This is where we get into the military um, sort of domains where people have classified data, etc., and you label, you have your classification level attached to data. And so this is an operating system that supports this label checking. Um, remember when I talked in week six about uh, Bella Padula as an example of this military style classification level? Um, <coughs> This, this is sort of um, what, what labeled security is about. And these are all meant for pretty much commercial operating systems. And then whereas the, the multi-level is more f towards um, the military use, and but it's also only for EL4. And then there's a separation kernel protection profile, generally called the SCIP, um, which is really all about strict partitioning. It's not a general operating system model. It, it just has the, the concept of security domains that need to be strictly partitioned. And this can be used up to ELS 7. Which operating systems have been evaluated according to those things? The answer is sort of all of them in a way, <laughs> which is the scary bit, right? So um, Mac OS. Nine years ago, it was evaluated under EL3, up to EL3, which basically means <laughs> shrug. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Windows, years before that, has been evaluated up to EL4, Windows 2000. Interestingly, that was just for a not network connected Windows system. <laughs> Extremely useful, I think. Uh, SUSE Linux has been evaluated to EL4. Solaris has been evaluated to EL4. Interesting, in Solaris case, they evaluate against the cap, which, as I said on the previous slide, is actually only suitable for EL3, and they evaluate it under EL4. I don't know how they got away with it. Um, they must have had some very lenient um, certifier, because that's not supposed to happen. And Red Hat Linux has been evaluated to EL4. So just about anything under the sun has been evaluated to EL4. And of course, they all get hacked regularly. So that tells you what a COM criteria EL4 means, not a lot, which is not surprising because, as I said, under the certification standard, the evaluation standard, you don't even look at the implementation at this level. The more serious ones, um, just over 10 years ago, Green Hills Integrity has been evaluated to EL6 against the skip. Uh, that's an interesting story in itself. Green Hills Integrity is basically a microkernel. It's in flavor, a bit similar to old L4 versions. It does a lot of the right stuff, having device drivers at user level, for example, message passing, all that sort of stuff. Um, I know the then CTO of Green Hills recently. Well, I talk to him every now and then, David Kleidermacher. Um, so that was a serious system. <laughs> Interestingly, if you look at the certification certificate, it actually says, and I quote as literally as I remember it, um, while the system does not certify common criteria requirements at any evaluation level, that's what it says. We give it the stamp anyway. So, I don't know. <laughs> wow. And just hot off the press, a French company called Proven Run 
They are actually, they're formal verification experts and um, they have built a new system from scratch, including their own language, etc. And there's just like one or two months ago got certified in France uh, under EL7. And as far as I know, that's the only EL7 certified operating system at all. Um, <clears throat> okay, interesting. So, so many operating systems, so few serious evaluations, right? And then to make things even more interesting, after Green Hills got their EL6 stamp, they got Adventurous. Now, I remind, what it doesn't say here is where these things have been done. So, basically, Windows, Linux, these were on x86 hardware. Solaris was presumably on Spark hardware. Green Hills was on a particular power PC processor because um, Green Hills, they are very strong in avionics, so all the military jets have um, integrity in there. And um, in avionics, people traditionally use PowerPC processors um, because, well, whatever reason they started with, um, and now they're firmly embedded, and you, you can't just use any shell, any processor for avionics. It needs to be a avionics certified to start with, so there's a lot of um, inertia in there. But basically, this evaluation was done just for a PowerPC process, just for a single one and a very particular configuration, which of course is by now over 10 years old. And then they got adventurous and started the one box, one wire project, OB1, where they said, okay, let's use this on x86 and do a secure workstation on um, commodity desktop hardware and um, use our integrity certification. Integrity so was the underlying separation kernel. And of course, this is secure, right? And NSA, please certify it. NSA said, hmm, not really. He said, Skip, this was the protection profile validation of community hardware platforms is infeasible due to their complexity. Basically, x86, forget it. You'll never get a stamp from us. And the skip has relevant um, relevance for these sort of platforms. Okay? And then they get, went one step further and says, this is all crap anyway. The whole concept of having an operating system certified independent of the hardware and uh, everything else makes no sense. And consequently, they disendorse the skip and not doing any COM criteria evaluations anymore. So the way COM criteria works is up to EL4, it's sort of internationally approved, um, accepted. So you get an AL6, AL4 certificate anywhere, you can basically, it's, it's accepted in any other country. And it's done by commercial certification agencies. Whereas anything above four, so including five and six as done by uh, Green Hills, they, there's still a commercial evaluator, but the certification actually is done by the NSA or their equivalent. Um, so the, the series spooks. And so the NSA doesn't deal with anything below EL5, but anything in the US from EL5 up would have been certified by the NSA. And they said, we're not doing that anymore. Bang. So that's interesting, which means in the US, you can't do COM criteria above EL4 any longer. And there's some good reasons behind that. COM criteria is basically a very expensive way to prove nothing. This cost, this used to be on, on Green Hill's website, one grand per line of code. <laughs> this is bloody expensive, right? Now this is a whole life cycle cost, design, implementation, testing, evaluation, and certification. So it contains a lot, but it's still bloody expensive, right? And um, it's very process focused. Com criteria is basically an glorified ISO 9000 process. You need Hit loads of documents on how you went about your what your development process is and what your QA works and you, how many tests you done and what all the results of them are. It's incredible, and just producing this is of course expensive. And evaluating this is of course expensive. So this is part of what drives up the cost. And um, 
as I said, only at EL5 they start looking at the code itself. In the lower evaluation levels mean nothing as we've seen, right? Who cares whether Microsoft Windows has been evaluated to EL4? A, it was done in a non-network device, and B, uh, <laughs> it's full of holes and Linux the same, etc. So uh, this is all particularly very uninspiring. And then on top of that, we have these co commercial evaluation facilities. Now they get paid by doing the evaluation on the customer's behalf. And of course, if they rep develop a reputation of being particularly tough, the customer goes to a different lab. <laughs> this is part of the whole idea of having competition, right? And of course, it creates a race to the bottom. The, all the business will go to the ones who are most lenient in certifying things, and that just makes the whole thing ridiculous. And consequence, in a lot of e European countries, they still use common criteria, like um, this um, proven, proven run system that's been evaluated in France, Germany uses it, etc. But in five ICE countries, it's basically dead. The defense does not really deal with common criteria anymore. This is the sad story of um, evaluation regimes. Now, how about formal verification? So this is mathematical techniques. Formal verification was very, very popular in the 80s, maybe early 90s, a bit like microkernels, right? And um, they sort of were over-promised, under-delivered. The, the US defense spent a lot of money in formal verification in the 1980s. Um, and then very little came out of it, and they got completely disillusioned by it. And then everyone basically, uh, oh, this is just some mathematicians doing fun stuff uh, of no real use. Um, so that, that was the state uh, until about 10 years ago. So there's basically two different approaches you can use there. The one is um, abstract interpretation, and uh, one particular version of that is model checking, where you basically um, formally check a model of the system for certain properties. So for example, you might have a, um, w one thing you can easily do with um, model checking is checking for uninitialized variables. So I trace the code to see whether anywhere there is a variable being used where you haven't seen an evaluation. So where you can't con show that all the code paths leading to that point have evaluated that variable. And um, model checking can do this reasonably well. Or things like um, buffer overflows. It may be possible for many programs to prove with model checking that no buffer overflow happens because, well, again, it looks at the code paths going to a certain point and says, OK, does every code pass leaving us here have a range check that ensures that this pointer is or this index is in range? So these are the th sort of things you can prove with um, model checking and abstract interpretation. It's basically um, model checking is an evaluation of actual code paths. Abstract interpretation abstracts them somehow, so you don't need to look at every um, possible state of the system, but states are abstracted into sort of mega states that are considered equivalent. Um, and gives you much better scalability, etc. But the general issue with all this is um, you basically have a choice of having false positives or false negatives. In most cases, it's not comprehensively possible to comprehensively prove exactly that the code is safe. You either have to overestimate, meaning you're pessimistic, and that leads to false positives. So you identify potential problems with the code, which turns out are not a real problem. And so that's a nuisance for using those things. Or you have false negatives, which means there's bugs which are not caught. And these are, these, these are then unsound, right? They don't really prove anything. If you have a system that is sound, then it will produce false positives. But at least you know that anything, that if it says, yes, I've proven this, then it's actually correct. If you have a system that's unsound, it's generally much faster but it doesn't actually prove anything. So these are basically debugging aids as opposed to actual proofs of properties. In general, these, um, all these methods, because they explore the state space of a program, suffer from state space explosion. So, and that means you're fairly restricted in the kind of properties you can prove. Where it works, it's fine, it scales well, 
Um, some of these model shakers can deal with code bases of a million lines of code for very specific properties. So the alternative is um, theorem proving, which in principle can deal with inf infinite state spaces, even though, of course, we never have this on a computer, where you basically show that um, code has a, for example, a refinement property. You, you, specify, you have a formal mathematical specification of the functionality. So, for example, you define a function as a mathematical function of producing an output as a function of its inputs. And then theorem proving says, OK, we look at this step by step and show that every transition in this program um, is in line with the specification. And in the end, you can actually prove functional correctness, which uh, model checking can never do. So functional correctness means, OK, you have proof that the implementation of your function is actually a correct implementation of the formal specification. These things can, the drawback of theorem proving, it's very labor intensive. There's a um, limited degree to which you can automate those things. Uh, they like programming, right? Programming itself. I remember when I was um, a student when people talked about, ah, programmers will be eliminated in 15 years' time because it's all going to be automated. <laughs> and same with um, theorem proving, right? It requires human intuition and intelligence and insight to, to actually prove those things. Some, some things can be done automatically, but it's a small subset. So complete in the sense giving you actual functional correctness, but very expensive in terms of labor. This one can be fully automated, often a bit fiddly, but um, suffers state space explosion and can only prove narrow properties. So these are the, the two fundamental approaches. Some of these techniques, if your system is in some way simple enough, it is sometimes possible to actually prove complete function correctness with these techniques. It has been done um, two years ago with a toy operating system, the hyperkernel. But it is toy and will never grow beyond toy because uh, they had to make certain fundamental assumptions on the form of the specification, which basically translate into all loops being strictly bounded on, among others and other finiteness requirements. But it's, it still was impressive what they did. OK, so this is a principle. And um, in the last 15 years or so, this system, these approaches have matured a lot from being really sort of something that um, the people with the big pockets um, were extremely disillusioned about and got completely turned off to being actually really useful in the real world. And the first significant progress there in terms of actual systems was this SOSP paper from 18 years ago um, where Dawson Engler and his student, Dawson is a professor at Stanford, they applied static analysis to Linux, and they, they did a lot of development of the static analyzers themselves to the point where they could actually run them over the Linux source code. And they did um, a study on sort of bug densities in Linux and found, OK, unsurprising, device drivers are the most buggy code, yes, uh, because they're written by Sparkies, etc. cetera. And, uh, and um, in general, they found a pretty high de bug density. Again, unsurprising. So this is okay, this is good, this was a real achievement, and then they created this company Coverity, where they do this as a service, etc. And including, I mean, it was a commercial business, they had to make money, but they actually allowed open source projects to use the tools for free, so the Linux folks could actually use them for free. And you said, okay, they must be jumping on this, right? And run this all the time and make sure that none of these automatic, I mean, this is free, right? It, you, you run it on the server, it runs automatically and then it spits out possible bugs. And okay, you have false positives. So you need to do annotations or something to say, okay, this is a false positive. Don't bother me with this one again. Um, but this should be an extremely valuable tool. So what does the Linux community do? Guess. They ignored it, yes, pretty much. <laughs> because they're Linux community, right? <laughs> so 10 years later, guys from Inlia reanalyzed Linux. So basically, they did a similar analysis to what was done by Dawson and his student using purely open source model checkers. 
So absolutely no excuse for not taking those, including some of them they had developed themselves, and looked at, so they talk about fault rate, but it's not actually fault rate. This is things that are spit out by the model checker. And um, they're obviously just a small proportion of the actual bugs in the system. Now, you would think anything that's detectable by a model checker should not exist in the kernel anymore because a decent QA process would mean you run this first before you release it. So this should all be zero. <laughs> and of course they're not. <laughs> um, they have, drivers have seen some improvement from 0.8 percentage of faulty nodes. So that basically means eight things per thousand lines of code or maybe function points, I don't remember the exact definition. Um, a fair number in any case, down to about half that. Okay, factor of two improvement for something that should be zero. Um, other things like um, particular driver, the sound drivers, they didn't hardly change at all. The file systems dropped maybe a third or so. I mean, what the hell are those folks doing? So much about the um, Linux community using state-of-the-art techniques. And of course, the result um, couldn't resist this one. This was after the Linux, the kernel summit from three years, two and a half years ago, <laughs> where the Ars Technica uh, reporter got away with this nice quote, unsafe at any clock speed. And um, it's really true, it needs a security in Linux needs a rethink, but the rethink is a rewrite because it's unsolvable. Um, <clears throat> and of course you get things, nice things like that. Right? So this has happened out there. And then um, 10 years ago, something's changed. So these are August 10 years ago. Some of the headlines here. I still remember this one. I talked to this reporter for like half an hour and thought she got it, but she was utterly clueless. <laughs> um, is of, uh, Silgarian, as usual, has a reasonably informed comment. Uh, Nick Dowens, I don't know where they got this one. <laughs> uh, okay, Dr. Tom was really good. Uh, safer software in general. Does it, if you compare Australian media with the rest of the world, what they wrote, the Australian media reports are typically complete crap, <laughs> whereas the rest of the world ones are ten, tend to be fairly informed. Again, I don't, I don't know. This, this was following an interview with me. I don't know what they got the secret trials from. I didn't say no such thing, of course. Um, I don't know what this one says, but um, you can see full machine shake proof and Nikta and what does it say SEL4? Here it says L4, SEL4. <laughs> can anyone read this? But it's a like, um, the French one, that was reasonably correct. We could check that one. A German one. Researchers report mathematical proof of bug free code. India, some Italian, uh, this looks like Japanese. Another fairly extensive article, something in Russian. Um, again, German. Slashdot, of course, was hilarious reading the comments on Slashdot, as you expect. <laughs> um, and even new scientists. So this uh, created a fair bit of an echo, and then we got awarded the MIT Technology Review Top 10 um, breakthrough. They have uh, every year they award uh, 10 breakthrough technologies they expect will change the world. So what was behind this? Um, this is when we finished the first the functional correctness proof of SEL4 at the time. Um, and what the, 
this means is we have an implementation of SEO4 that's mostly C code. There's a little bit of assembler that's unverified, and but we we did everything we could to minimize the amount of assembler. So there's an assembler only where it's absolutely needed. Everything else written in C, and then we have this abstract model, which is the functionality of the kernel defined in a mathematical language, and then we have a proof that of functional correctness or strictly speaking a refinement I'll get to that that shows that the C is a correct implementation of this abstract spec so this is under the the semantics of the C language this program here will have behavior that is allowed under this specification is what it really means and that was done ten, that was the thing that was done 10 years ago and this is very powerful. It basically means we now can forget about the C code and we can reason about the system at this abstract level, which is a much simpler and it's in a clean mathematical environment, etc. Uh, it still means, of course, it's not the C code that's running on the machine, it's the, the binary. So what about the binary code? Well, we then added a proof. And while this one is theorem proving, so very labor intensive, this is a tool chain that automatically runs over the thing and proves uh, equivalence, basically shows, yes, the, the binary code is a correct translation of the C. And that means, okay, now we have no longer have to trust the compiler or our assumption on C semantics. And the C semantics is an issue because C, as you may be aware of, doesn't have a well-defined semantics. It's actually, it has an ambiguous semantics. So in order to do anything, you have to make assumption on the semantics. And in particular, we restricted ourselves to a subset of C. It's about a 95% subset for which we clearly define the semantics. But of course, there's no proof that the compiler, or without further proof, you don't know that the compiler makes the same assumption on this semantics of our subset as we did. So it's important to prove the equivalence, which takes the, the compiler and the semantics out of the trust space. And then we know, OK, we have now a proof chain that shows the binary code, the behavior of the binary code is as allowed by the uh, abstract model. And so again, we can reason about the abstract model and know that this thing that runs on the silicon will actually behave like it. And then because we have this abstract model, we can then prove further things at the abstract model level. Uh, so this is where it gets really powerful. Because just because we have an abstract model, that's, that's nice. We now know very, in, very precisely, unambiguously, how the kernel behaves. It doesn't mean the, ker the kernel's behavior is, is the one we want. So this is what these proofs are for. We can then show that the kernel, if configured correctly, will enforce these um, isolation properties. And um, <clears throat> on top of that, we also have a core safety property, namely a worst case execution time analysis of the kernel. So we now, we, we have an upper bound of any kernel operations latency and therefore can do hard real time on top of that system, which all of this was completely new. So this was the first time ever a non-trivial system has operating system had a functional correctness proof translation correctness things have been done although never to an operating system the worst case execution time analysis has never been done for protected mode operating system to my surprise i'm not sure what all these real-time folks do all the time they talk about worst case execution time all the time but they use it on toy problems and um, these kind of properties have been proven before against an abstract model of the system, but no one knew whether that abstract model was really related to the implementation. So there's a lo lot of worlds for us in there. It's still not quite complete. So I always believe in truth in advertising. I'll, I'll go through the restrictions on a later slide. I'll just flag them up here so to make obvious that there's nothing hidden. And the interesting thing was when we started this project, I told the team, my, my big concern was, OK, we, we have a bunch of mathematicians, and they do what the mathematicians did in the 80s. I gave formal methods a bad name, is they verify toys, and you get something that is good enough for writing papers, but not good enough for reality. And we really wanted to be, have a system that is useful in the real world. So 
And of course, for microkernels, that in particular means performance needs to be right. So my uh, word to the team was, I will not consider this project a success if we lose more than 10% in um, IPC performance. And at the time of this paper 10 years ago, this is pretty much where we were. We were within uh, the, the IPC fast path. It had a verified fast path, but it was about 10% slower than the um, fastest kernel we had built before. By now, the verified SEL4 kernel is faster than any kernel we built before. So we, we, we definitely shown that you don't have to sacrifice performance for correctness or security. Or so it's the world's fastest microkernel, by at least a factor of two from every, any numbers I've seen, except for our earlier ones. OK, so what's behind this? Um, as I said, we have for this functional correctness proof, we have an abstract model and we have the C implementation and we do a proof of a equivalence in a certain sense. Turns out for practical reasons, we didn't do this in one step, we had an intermediate level. So we actually proved first from the abstract model to this executable model and then from there to C. And the executable model was derived from a Haskell implementation. Um, this started because initially we had used Haskell as a semi-formal specification language, which we could automatically f turn into the actual abstract model. And then one student literally over a weekend uh, said, oh, might as well implement it in Haskell. And then we had an Haskell implementation of the spec. And that turned out to be a really good rapid prototyping tool because we were developing the spec at the same time as we were verifying it because SEL4 has, as um, you hopefully appreciate by now, had a lot of innovation in terms of the operating system model itself. And all that was sort of just being designed there. So uh, the, the, the poor verifier were basically shooting at the moving target. And by having this Haskell model here, we could, uh, on one sense, very quickly iterate through design and implementation, at least at the Haskell level. And, um, but also, they had something um, they could aim for as a first step. And then the C implementation was initially written by just manually translating from Haskell into C. And that was done over two weeks. So once we had a stable version of the Haskell model, Someone translated it into C, and then we did these uh, verification steps. Uh, the first one from the abstract model to the executable model, and then from executable to C. And what these are, strictly speaking, are refinement, which basically means if we do a refinement proof from the abstract model to the executable model, that means that any possible behavior of this model is captured by this model. So it's a, it's a subset of possible behaviors of that one. And that, that's a very strict way of saying it's correctly implemented. Um, so just to give you an idea, actually I forgot to put the number of lines of code on. So this was about 9,000 lines of code. The spec was still a few thousand lines of spec, so it's not trivial, which is why it was important to prove properties about it. But look at the number of lines of proof required to do this. 120,000 lines of proofs, and these are almost all manually written. <laughs> so there's a lot of work in here. But also this shows you that if this was pen and paper proofs, they would be completely worthless because the proofs would be more buggy than the code itself because there's so much more of it. So this only makes sense in a mathematical theorem proof assistant that doesn't allow you to do incorrect proofs. So in total, the first correctness proof was about 170,000 lines of proof, of which I think about 20 or 30,000 were machine generated. There was one particular, the bit fiddling library that was um, generated automatically, everything else manually written. So you can imagine that's not a, quite a cheap pro process, right? And to give you an idea of what this looks like, so this is a snippet from the abstract spec, and it basically defines the scheduler. So what it says is the scheduler looks at runnable threads, basically active TECBs, and selects one of these and um, 
then may do some cache flushing, etc. As you can see, that's a very high level specification of the schedule. It basically says, take a runnable thread. It doesn't say anything about the scheduling policy, which says, among others, that the abstract model is unsuitable for reasoning about real-time behavior because it doesn't say anything of what scheduling policy is implemented. And then the, at the executable model, this is now Haskell. The way it looks like is get the scheduler and then um, normal scheduling operation is you look at a runnable thread and do some updates, etc. And again, it still doesn't have an actual scheduling policy in there. Um, that needs to be refined later in order to actually have meaningful, um, have a meaningful way of actually reasoning about time and assist. And this, in the end, then gets very f refined down to the actual C code. And here we deal with priorities and um, sh scheduling queues and, and all that stuff. What do those proofs really mean? This is what I said before, right? The C code is full, is, its behavior is fully captured by the abstract model. In other words, it cannot show any behavior that's not allowed by the abstract model. And it's also fully captured by the executable model, and um, which gives you this nice property that then you can prove things about the abstract model without worrying about the implementation. And then a few things that sort of either fall out of the proofs or have to be um, explicitly established in order to prove functional correctness is things that the kernel has never any undefined behavior because that would violate this here. The spec does not say behavior is undefined, may stop, crash, whatever, and therefore that's explicitly proved in here. And because it doesn't have any undefined behavior, that means there's no uninitialized pointer they referenced no arrays out of bounds and therefore of course you can never have um, a stack smashing attack or anything of that sort on SEO 4 that's explicitly proved not to be possible. This calls terminate, memory is safely reclaimed so you can't have dangling pointers after destroying an object. Um, Objects don't overlap, so it, object semantics are always well defined, etc. And access control is decidable, which is um, what I said three weeks ago is an important project for reasoning about security properties in the system. These are, of course, only a small subset of all the things that are proof, right? Functional correctness is a much more powerful property. So, this was about 9,000 lines of code, the original version. Have a guess, how many bugs did we find in the verification? Typical rule of thumb, right? Um, Well-engineered code has one to five lines, bugs per li thousand lines of code. So you're looking at order of, um, well, 10 to, yeah, 10 to 50 roughly if it was well-engineered code. Of course, we knew we were going to prove it, so we didn't invest heavily in QA. As a matter of fact, the only QA we did is let some poor students uh, work with a prototype, and they flushed out a few bucks, but very small number, <laughs> 16 all up. 460 were found in verification. And the interesting thing is they break down almost equally between the C level, the design level, so that's the um, executable spec, and the abstract spec, which is really interesting. And this is something we've seen over and over just by specifying the system. So when we, the proof lives, the kernel lives, it evolves, and we don't commit anything to mainline that it breaks existing proofs. So if the, um, if the update to the kernel updates anything that's been verified, we've re-verified before we submit it to mainline and uh, the proofs get resubmitted. So the, this, is, this proof has been evolving for 10 years. Uh, and what we find whenever we do new things, for example, verify an implementation of a different architecture, the API is not a complete hardware abstraction. The, as you know, the, uh, the underlying hardware shines through, and that's intentional. Or we do things like the mixed criticality model, 
implement that. We always start off specifying it first. And I think nowadays that we have a decent QA and we have a very extensive regression suite where everything runs through every night, etc. cetera. Um, the ratio has actually shifted towards the spec side. We flush out most bugs when specifying and the rest gets mostly um, flushed out when we do the, when we prove abstract invariance, which is basically what 80% of the work went into. So these are invariants which we need later, which are proved about the abstract spec. Um, and then the verifying that the executable spec level is a correct, uh, is a refinement of the abstract spec. Once we've gone through here, nowadays I would say we got rid of at least 90% of the bugs. And that, that itself is sort of a really convincing argument for, use, argument for using formal methods. Even if you don't completely verify the system, just specifying it well. And this is sort of the justification why in common criteria you have in many levels, you have a formalized spec, but nothing else formalized. And at EL5 and at EL6, you have a formalized uh, spec and formalized design. This is because that really uncovers a lot of bugs. Okay. Let's look at the binary verification in more detail. So we have a C program, which is our kernel implementation, which is compiled by a compiler, GCC, which we can't really trust, into a binary. And the question is, how can we verify that the binary is actually a correct translation of the C? Well, turns out we don't actually need to verify the C source because what we really have is a formalized C program, which was created by a formal semantics, which is basically a parser for C written inside the theorem prover, which can import the C source into um, the theorem prover and give it a formal meaning. And this actually is what has been verified as, correct as a correct implementation of the formal spec in our functional correctness proof I discussed earlier. So really what we want to show is that the binary code is a correct translation of this formalized C or a refinement of this C. And unlike the functional correctness proof, which was done mostly manually in the theorem prover, this is a two tool chain that consists of several steps. The first one is that we have a formal semantics of the ISA of the architecture, which specifies how the architecture operates. So this formal ISA spec, um, again, is done in the, in the theorem prover, um, allows us to read the binary and give it a formal meaning. So this results then in this formalized binary. And of course, the, this is correct as long as the formal ISA spec correctly represents the hardware. So uh, I suspect in this sense is critical, uh, is correctness critical. And once we have this formalized binary, then we have a decompiler which massages it into a higher level representation. Specifically, what it does is it extracts inside a theorem prover, so all provably correct, um, the control flow graph of this binary program. Uh, this step was done by Magnus Marin, who was then originally at Cambridge. He is now a professor at Chalmers in Sweden. And he, together with Anthony Fox, who now works for ARM, actually created this ISA, this formal ISA spec for the ARM processor. When we originally started that, we did this on V6. We now have it for V7 and 8. So we have these two steps, the formalization using the formal ISA spec, and then the C compiler to generate of, out of this really relatively unstructured binary a more high level functional representation in this graph rep, uh, language, which, as I said, represents the control flow. This is actually a hard problem in generally Turing complete, um, but we can have some help in terms of hints given by the simple tables which the compiler leaves behind in the binary. So the decompiler makes use of these simple tables to help it construct this um, graph language representation of the program's control flow. Note that the simple tables are actually just hints. They're not correctness critical. So if there's something wrong, then the, the decompiler may just not succeed extracting the control flow graph uh, 
but it will not produce an incorrect one. So now we have a representation of our binary which is in a functional language which is uh, and more abstract more high level and therefore much easier to reason about so that was the, the first part of this correctness proof the second one is to also translate the formula c into the same graph language this is done again in the theorem prover and therefore provably correct with a bunch of rewrite rules these rewrite rules basically simulate what the compiler does in um, translating the C construct in, into a control flow for a low-level um, program. And now we have the problem reduced to showing the equivalence of two programs in the same language. Still, in general, that's true and complete. However, we're not solving the really general problem here, but we solve what we actually have is we have two artifacts which we know should be equivalent because they were produced by really the same compiler out of the same source. And what we need to do now is just show that they are equivalent. And we do this by um, processing it bit by bit in small um, sections that may or may not correspond to basic blocks and that are simple enough to make the proof relatively easy and automatable. And the automation is done with a tool called an SMT solver. SMT solvers are um, a class of these automatic proving tools I alluded to earlier. And um, they, they are good at automatically proving certain things, and, but they're fairly restricted. The advantage is, OK, because it's fully automatic and um, uh, it, it doesn't require a lot of human intervention. It still does because the way to, to, to phrase the problem that we can throw at an SMT solver is actually can be quite tricky. And the SMT solvers tend to be temperamental beasts where something they prove something today and they fail to prove it tomorrow and there was an update to the solver with different heuristics, etc. So this is all a bit fiddly. But the good thing is if the SMT solver says yes, then we have proved two bits of these programs equivalent. And we do this bit by bit, and in the end, we, if everything works well, we have shown the equivalence of the two programs. One was the, the um, transformation, provably correct transformation of our Formula C program. The other was a provably correct transformation of our formula, um, formalized binary. And therefore, then we have shown that the, um, the binary is actually a correct translation or refinement of the Formula C. As I said, this is not all that easy. Um, some of the things can be quite challenging, in particular because of compiler optimizations. We normally compile, build our kernel with um, GCC uh, optimization level two, and there it, it, it massages loops a fair bit, moves things out of loops, um, rolls them around, unrolls them, etc. And this creates some challenges. And as of today, I think there's at least one um, loop in the kernel which we never managed to automatically prove with minus O2. It, it works reasonably well with um, optimization O1. And um, what we should really do is just uh, just compile this one particular loop with O1 and the rest with O2 and hopefully that would actually all the work automatically and that proof loop is not going to be performance critical. So this is a fine thing to do. The upshot of this is then we can have our kernel compiled by an untrusted compiler, GCC, which everyone loves or hates, and can prove that it didn't introduce bugs. Or it didn't have any Trojans that would introduce backdoors or anything. This is all categorically included with this proof chain. Um, there's alternative ways to do that. In particular, there exists a what's called a certifying compiler called ComCert, which was developed at the same time as SEL4 by Xavier Leroy at INRIA. And it uh, compiles a C program into a binary and spits out as well um, at the same time a proof that the binary is a correct translation of the C. Um, if, you, if you have a certifying compiler like this, then we don't need this complex proof chain here. The problem is um, ComCert doesn't really help us with SEL4. One reason is that 
it doesn't produce as fast a kernel, so there's inefficiencies. That's not too bad. We can deal with that, could deal with that, um, particular with working with Xavier in optimizing it further, etc. We did some of that in the past. But the fundamental problem is CompCert uses a different logic than our formal verification framework. And in particular, its formalization of the C semantics is done in a different formalism as ours. And amazingly, it's very hard to prove the equivalence of these two semantics. And therefore, if we translate our kernel with CompCert, we can't connect up the proofs that CompCert does against our functional correctness proof. So we have this um, assurance gap around the C semantics, and that's bad. With this um, automatic tool chain we developed and the, the core bits, the rewrite rules and the SMT solver part was done by a very smart PhD student called Tom Sewell. Um, with this approach, we can take an untrusted C compiler and our assumptions on the semantics of C fall out. And this is really important because C in general has a, a um, undefined semantics in sp some parts of it are ambiguous. And so we need to narrow it down to some uh, formalization. And because we connect, we prove directly the formalized C correct against the high level spec of the kernel, and then prove that this formalized C refines to the binary, our semantics, our assumptions on the C semantics fall out and we don't have to worry about whether it's correct or not, and whether we assume the same things as the compiler and all that. So this is a really strong result and very cool. And it is actually has some real practical advantages. I earlier mentioned that there is this proven core kernel from French company Proven Run, which also has been proved correct against its um, specification. And they do it in the same framework as that CompCert uses, the Cox theorem prover. And so they can actually use uh, CompCert to compile their verified kernel into a verified binary. Really nice. That means they don't have this, don't have to go through this effort in building this binary verification tool chain as we did. Turns out, well, in practice, it's actually not so nice because I, I talked to the, the guys from this company who did the work. They're, they're nice people, very good to talk to, um, very smart, I have high respect for them. And they told me, yeah, um, turns out people in industry don't want to use CompCert, they want to use GCC. And of course, if you use GCC on their system, then the whole binary correctness goes out of the window. So in our framework, we have the advantage that we can use unmodified, untrustworthy GCC and still get our binary correctness proof. Pretty cool. Now, as I said before, we have this uh, functional correctness proof that the code implements a spec. That doesn't mean the spec is actually has the right properties, so we need to prove properties about the spec, in particular the CIA properties. And turns out this is really made feasible by two things. One is the fact that we can operate at the abstract spec because we have the functional correctness proof. But the other is the way SEO force resource management approach works. So this is really um, leveraging the model in SEO four that all resource management is delegated up to user level. Because what that really means is if you have two partitions where you partition the memory between them because all the kernel objects have to be provided by user level, you automatically get the partitioning of the kernel data structures. So this is a really powerful property and that enables a lot of these security proofs. So for example, integrity is about limiting write access. So integrity means that a low um, insurance domain must not be able to mess with data in the high assurance domain. And um, that includes the kernel must not mess 
with high state on behalf of flow. And of course, in a capability system, that means write access is only allowed if you have a capability. And in particular, the kernel must not modify any of its metadata unless it's been explicitly authorized by a capability. And because low doesn't have capabilities to highest object or metadata, it can't interfere and we use this property for proving integrity. So this is basically what, what needs to be proved there is that the kernel um, respects capabilities. It doesn't perform operations that are not explicitly authorized by CAP. In an event-based kernel as SEO4, this is um, relatively straightforward because the kernel operates always on behalf of a specific user and you can show that it has the right capabilities, etc. Okay, so this was done and um, was relatively straightforward. The next one is availability. Turns out, well, this is actually trivial in SEO4. And again, this comes down to the memory management model. Because we have this complete resource isolation, even for kernel data, availability falls out for free. There's nothing left to prove. If we have this partition system, there's no way low can in any way stop high from accessing the resources it's been promised. And that's what the availability means. So this is a no-op. Confidentiality is the hard one. Even though it's sort of just a dual of integrity, well, integrity is about write accesses, in, uh, confidentiality is about read accesses. So low must not be able to obtain any of high data unless it's been explicitly authorized by a capability. And what makes this one challenging is that we can't, for integrity, if integrity is broken, then high state changes, and it, that's observable on the high side. With confidentiality, that's not true. What, what changes is low state and not high state. And because the violation is not observable by the state of high, that makes it much harder to prove. So what they had to do is what's called um, a non-interference proof, which basically means you look at two arbitrary um, two arbitrary evolutions of low state. And the only difference between the initial states of this um, state change, sequence of state changes is a difference in, the, in high state. So low starts off two arbitrary executions, low starts off in exactly the same state, except high has a different state. And then you want to prove that high state has no impact on low's execution. And um, so basically you show that these execution, the two arbitrary execution traces are exactly the same, even if the high state ends up, uh, starts off being separate. And if that's the case, then you know that low is not influenced by high state and therefore low cannot learn anything about high state. Turns out this is actually not so easy as it sounds because one of the challenges is that refinement does not preserve confidentiality. So look at this specification of a function. So we have a function that holds a secret and returns a value. And we could refine this into a function that returns the secret. This is a correct refinement because it's one of these um, implementations that's allowed by the spec. The spec doesn't say anything about not leaking the secret. It's hard to express that, in fact. Um, so in, instead of returning, say, always zero, we can just say it returns the secret, and that would be a correct refinement. So by um, ha that means that if you prove that confidentiality is maintained at the abstract spec level, that might be violated by the implementation. So a lot of the effort in that proof went into removing this non-determinism because that's exactly what makes this um, refinement, this confidentiality non-preserving refinement possible is there's a non-determinism in the specification because it doesn't specify what the function returns and therefore the implementation is free to 
substitute any particular uh, um, return. So it means that we need to take all of this non-determinism out of the formal spec and then um, confidentiality is conserved under refinement and that means we can then with uh, proof confidentiality at the abstract spec level. For example, <coughs> need to completely unambiguously specify how the scheduler works and a lot of the other things. And in order to make this tractable, we end up being saying, okay, we have partitions and they're just scheduled strictly around drop-in with a fixed time slice, etc. Turns out this is nice on paper and it's nice to say SEO4 has a confidentiality proof and we do that all the time. <laughs> but if you really look at it, it's actually not a particularly useful property. And this is an inherent problem with this infoflow reasoning is that it, it's a sledgehammer approach. It basically is such a coarse property that if you make the system conform to this information flow property that no information is allowed to flow across certain boundaries, then you get to an extremely restricted system. So we actually use this separation kernel setup of SEO4 in some military kind of devices. I'll give you an example later on where it's actually used, but in most systems, including the ones you build, this is way too strong a property to be useful. So one of the ongoing challenges, find out a better definition of um, confidentiality, which on the one side we can prove about SEO4, but on the other side, applies to actually usable real world systems. So in terms of the overall assurance story, this is pretty in the weakest point. Good, so let's get back on sort of the limitations and assumptions of all this thing. Any proof always is based on assumptions. You always have to assume something, right? It's not turtles all the way down. And in particular, we clearly need to assume that the hardware behaves as we assume it does. So we have a formal spec of the hardware and we need to assume that the hardware actually conforms to that. And unfortunately, we don't have a proof of this. Turns out there is actually work in progress on verifying hardware implementations against the ISA, so doing a verified RTL, for example, but um, doesn't exist for any real world process as far as I'm aware of. Although I expect in the RISC-V world we will see something like that within the next five years. So this is one of the exciting things about RISC-V. I know ARM is also working on this. So the um, hardware spec, uh, uh, a sim similar but different spec than the one we use is actually now used in ARM extensively and they, they are themselves validating the implementation against it and increasingly proof that at least parts of the implementation are conformant to that, but it, it's still a long time to have a verified ARM processor. So basically, yes, we need, we have um, our hardware software contract and we have to assume that the hardware adheres to it and we can prove that the software adheres to it. And of course, hardware has bugs just as much as software has. So in a way, we know this assumption is not strictly true, but that's the best we can do. And the more scary thing is that people actually put Trojans in in the production process. And this is something we can't protect against at the software level. So this is where hardware people have work to do. And the second one is the big one is sort of the other side, right? The hardware is the lower level interface, but the same issue exists with the high level interface because in the end, we need to specify something and we need to specify it formally in a mathematical logic and there's no guarantee that this actually matches what we imagine the spec is because in the end somewhere the mathematical world meets the physical world and you cannot prove that they actually that the models agree you can only look at reasoning about it test properties etc so there's always um, a risk that there's a mismatch here. Of course, this risk is always there whether you formally verify your system or not. But if we formally verify your system, we know at least the other uh, sources of bugs are gone and this is basically the remaining challenge. And it's an inherent one. And we also have to Assume that our proof checker is correct. Remember, I told you that this is all, all this um, theorem proving is done in a mathematical proof assistant. 
and it has a small proof checking core which checks for whenever you do a proof step that this is a um, correct trans and allowed transformation under the mathematical framework. So the set of axioms and previously proving lemmas, etc., they together provide sort of a mathematical space against this needs to be conformed. And the, the proof checker does that automatically. It will not allow you to enter a proof that uh, violates any of these. But of course, we have to assume that the checker is correct. But again, this is probably the lowest risk of all, all these things here because it's a relatively small checker in a proof assistant that's used in a very wide varieties of proofs. And unlike a compiler, uh, which is also used to translate a lot of code, there's so many bugs in the code to start with that um, you don't necessarily find all the bugs in the compiler. The story here is different, right? If people start proving incorrect theorems, um, chances are pretty high that someone will notice. Fortunately, what we don't have to trust is a compiler, so that this is a really good part of the story. But compared to anything else, even though these are sort of sometimes a bit strong assumptions, but compared to what everyone else makes, this is really mild. Because, well, if you look at Linux, you have to trust that a million, 10 million lines of code are implemented without bugs, and you know they're not. <laughs> so these are the assumptions. What are the limitations? And I had this box up before, but this is now looking at a bit more detail. A, we still haven't quite verified our boot code. This is sort of a background activity. When we hire new proof engineers, we let um, them verify bits of the boot code and eventually we'll probably get there. More likely someone really wants to deploy this in an in a environment that matters and is going to put up money on the table to actually do it completely and um, then it will happen. At the moment, there's some challenges there, but it's also boring. So. But it is really important because um, all of our all the proofs we have, they basically say if the system is in a safe state, then any transformation possible will lead it in a safe state again. But if the system doesn't start up in a safe state, those proofs mean nothing. And so initial proving that the system after boot up actually is in a safe state is really important, except we haven't done it yet. And that was brought home to us a few years ago when someone found out a bug in the boot code, which had been there for years, <laughs> years after open sourcing, um, which meant that on certain hardware, the system would boot in an unsafe state and user co could crash it at um, arbitrary time. So this is not what you want. So hopefully we'll, we'll close that loop soon. Then some of the privileged state is uh, not modeled at the ISA level, but sort of more abstractly, which also has risks that it's incorrect. And that's basically dealing with the MMU. Um, so we, we basically have a model of page tables. And we assume that, OK, if you do the right thing to page tables, then this will work correctly. Uh, fortunately, this rather um, unpleasant situation has just been resolved. So a PhD has just finished that formalized the MMU. So um, probably within this year, that hole will be completely closed. And then the main risk is still caches and a little bit of assembly code we need for saving and restoring context. And the saving and restoring context, you can deal with that by code inspection. That's not so critical. But dealing pro properly with caches is a bit more painful. And uh, we really need to resolve that one. And then we have our fra formal framework doesn't have a notion of time. So we always prove functional correctness properties. And anything to do with time is unproven. Some of these can be proved. So at the moment, we have no proof that the scheduler implements the scheduling policy correctly, in particular observes priorities. Now, that is a functional property. And that should be proven. This is basically we our model is too abstract. So we have a proof against an abstract model that abstracts the pro things like priorities away. So we need to refine that into something that actually represents the shader policy and then verify that. And then the 
the standard uh, machinery will do this. I said that we had a worst case execution time analysis of the kernel. We did that as long as we could, namely for these um, V6 and V early V7 cores where ARM actually published worst case latencies of all instructions. So we could do a sound analysis there with the later course starting with the A9 ARM went into out of order implementations and they stopped publishing any of this information even for their in order course like the A7. So we can't do this on ARM anymore which is annoying but fortunately we now have RISC-V, we have the implementation, we can extract all the latencies from the open implementation of our course and we will be able to do this again. So sometime that one will be taken care of at least for RISC-V. And then because our no, um, formalism has no notion of time, we can't, re we can't prove anything about timing channels in the existing framework, but I will soon talk to you about how we, I think we can do this after all. So at the moment, these are the limitations we have. Compared to common criteria, we're already way better than the, the toughest level of common criteria, right? Because we do everything for them. All right, so let's have a little bit of the cost. I already sort of said this is not cheap. And um, so let's have a bit of a closer look here. So we had this verification story and this is data from the original paper from 10 years ago that talks about the investment of the, the effort that went into this. So two person years for the Haskell design. This was basically experimenting with the kernel API. As I said, SEL4 has a lot of innovation in terms of operating system models. It is in many ways the most advanced OS kernel ever done even ignoring the verification story and a lot of effort was required to get there so there's this is this two person years basically represent experimenting with the model until we in the, were initially satisfied of course we have evolved it since because it had shortcomings which some of which or most of which we have now eliminated um, but that was a significant piece of work of course that has nothing to do with formal verification the C implementation, two months. As I said, the original first C implementation was literally done in two weeks. Um, more time went into it later, mostly fast path, etc. Debugging and testing is there where we didn't really <laughs> do any QA. And then the actual proofs, eight person year for abstract refinement. So this is this, um, this first, uh, refinement step and then another three person year for the second refinement step. The reason for this asymmetric breakdown is actually intentional because this is all functional environments where it's relatively easy to reason about it because everything is um, side effect free etc. And so people like to operate in this space between the abstract spec and the executable spec and as I said, this one was derived from a Haskell implementation and we intentionally made that as low level as possible. So um, try to capture as much as feasible of the kernel data structures and algorithms at this level because this is where easier to do the refinement proof. And then the translation to C was straightforward and the verification that the C is a correct implementation of that spec was also relatively easy to prove. And so this is why this only took three person years about a third of what the other proved it. And then, okay, there was a fast path, etc. And a lot of general proof libraries got developed as well. And these are all reusable. So the non-reusable verification thing, which is sort of the proper cost of doing the verified SEL4 kernel, if you like, um, 11 and a half person years. So that's not cheap. And the question is, how does this relate to other systems? Well, turns out it's actually not as bad as it sounds at first, because this is numbers we extracted from the pistachio kernel. Remember, Pistachio was the thing that then became OKL4, so Descendant is what's running on all iPhones, etc. Um, that was done in a very similar environment, about 
five to ten years earlier. University environment, people who've done kernels before, so they knew what they were doing, but okay, they were experimenting with the API, this the, came up with a new model. So quite comparable. And as you say, it's only maybe a factor of three difference. So it's not too bad. And of course, here we have real guarantees about correctness, and here we don't. But still, why is it so expensive to verify 9,000 lines of code? Part of the reason is given here. Guess what that is? It's the core graph of SEL4. <laughs> now, if we had done SEL4 independent of the verification story, then it wouldn't look like that. So this is partially an artifact of being a translation from a Haskell implementation with lots of small functions, etc. But what it also shows is that this is very highly connected not sort of like, this does not look like modularized code at all. And that's not surprising because my tongue-in-cheek definition of a microkernel is you take all the easy bits out and the black molasses that remains is the microkernel. And that's and every high-performance microkernel looks like that in a degree. So there, there's not a lot of structure inside the kernel and that's what makes um, verification hard because everything potentially interacts with everything and people, 80% of the verification cost was improving global invariance. Basically, this piece of code, or this data structure always will observe certain invariance no matter what code executes, these sort of things. And that literally 80% of the effort went into there. And that, this is a direct reflection of the structure. But again, as I said, any high performance microkernel will have this property. If if you look, I, I've never got my hands on the code of integrity, but I bet you a lot of money that it will not look like that because they probably have a highly modularized design because they want to be able to use mostly traditional QA plus some verification in order to make the thing tractable and they sacrifice performance in the process. Their, their kernel is about a fact of 10 slower than SEO4 in terms of IPC costs, which, which is a trade-off we didn't want to make. So ours is ruthlessly optimized for performance as any L4 kernel, and that's why it looks like that. But then the upside is once we've made this massive investment in functional correctness, a lot of the other things became easy. So the integrity proof was done in four months. That's pretty impressive. Integrity is a very strong property. And to be able, the advantage was it could be proved just on the abstract model because we had the refinement proof underneath. And um, it was really straightforward. And so proving this kind of properties about the abstract model is now re reasonably easy. Confidentiality was harder because, well, they had to develop new techniques because confidentiality is not normally um, observed under refinement and they had to invest into beefing up the abstract model to take the any non-determinism out, etc. So that's why it's more expensive. Um, availability, as I said, was for free. The binary correctness was two person years of building up a tool chain mostly, including a lot of these proving these transformation rules, which is totally reusable. And similar effort was for the, the worst case execution time analysis. And more recent work, we can actually improve the, the worst case execution time analysis, making more high assurance as well as tighter by using properties proved about the C code. Because as I said earlier, when I talked about the binary correctness proof, this, a lot of the semantics is lost in the binary. But at the C level, it's there. And the, the verification tool chain here used some of this information left in the binary in the form of simple tables for reconstructing some of the semantics to help it produce a better high level representation. And we can use similar trick actually using the same um, framework for importing properties we have proved at the C level into the binary and therefore helping the worst case execution time analysis. So this is how we ended up with um, a way more 
a high assurance way of doing worst case execution time analysis than anyone else has been able to do so far. So all up, we have a complete lifetime cost to when this first became usable of 400 bucks per line of code. Now remember the number from Green Hills, a thousand. So even though we have way stronger guarantees because we have actual functional correctness, it was way cheaper than what Green Hills did. And that was because they used this expensive um, glorified QA process in order to get assurance from their system. And the right, the nice advantage is we can actually afford to mess with the system, which they cannot. And this is part of the reason why theirs is so slow. As I said, fact of 10 I in terms of IPC performance compared to ours. We can optimize the hell out of our implementation. We can then check against the proof. If the proof still runs through, we know we're good. If it doesn't, then the place where it fails tells us exactly where we either have introduced a bug or we have to prove a new invariant or a lemma, etc. And so it's relatively easy to fix up. So having once gone through this thing, we can now really keep evolving the kernel and pull the verification with us. And so remain always with a uh, verified kernel, which is what traditional approaches, they can't do that. Because if you change a line of code, you have to go through all your QA again to establish that, OK, most likely you haven't introduced a bug, but it's only most likely in the best case, right? So they basically don't touch the code once it's gone through certification. And that's why the certification 10 years later is essentially meaningless, because Either you use a really old code base, you can't port it to a new processor, for example, or you basically operate on a different system. Whereas we keep on pulling our code whenever we evolve the kernel, we evolve the proof accordingly and only commit to mainline if the proof is not broken. So this is a very powerful property, and it's really core to build a high performance system. So looking at it in context, so we have SEO4, 400 bucks per line of code, Pistachio was um, about a factor of three cheaper, which is probably less of a difference than you th would have thought. Green Hill is about a factor of two to three more expensive, but is a slow system and one that can't evolve, whereas ours is fast and we can evolve it. But it would be really cool to end up there. And then this is basically where you have no more excuse not to use formal verification because formal verification is cost competitive. And this is where we're aiming. So this is a lot of our present research is about reaching this point. Not for SEO 4 itself, wouldn't buy us anything, we've done it. Um, but for new software, we're developing on top of the kernel. So the idea is to be able to do um, build components on top of SEO 4 that are verified, but at the cost that's basically at par with traditional Q8 system. Ah, it's a good question. So the original verification was done by a team which was probably in average about three full-time equivalent. So the whole team was sort of maybe five, seven people. Only a small number of them were really full-time of the proof. Some came and went. Um, the whole group around all this SEO4 stuff is about 40 people, but these days we do a lot of proof engineering, for example, porting the kernel to a new architecture and verifying that. So at the moment we do risk 5 By the end of the year, we expect to have a verified kernel with a full verification story, except for um, confidentiality on risk 5 um, So that will be a big step. And fortunately, there's a lot of people interested enough that they actually pay for this. So the original verification was done out of research funds. So this was done in NICTA, re federal um, public sector research organization. And I had a budget that allowed me to do this. Um, now just redoing the same thing on a different architecture, you couldn't justify out of research funds. So we depend on other people funding it, which um, at the moment seems to be working well. There's enough people, a lot of it US, defense, but also um, companies, both in the US and um, Europe, that are betting on this technology and keep on funding 
us blocking the holes.